Good morning to one and all, and welcome. Be welcome to this panel discussion on feminist epistemologies and methodologies for a feminist economy. My name is Jordi Bonnet. I am a professor of sociology at the University of Barcelona. And we have Wendy Harcourt with us, professor of gender diversity and sustainable development at the International Institute of Social Studies at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam in The Hague. She has been an editor and director of international programs in Italy for 23 years, published 15 books and 100 plus articles on sustainable women, gender, diversity, and feminist policy. She will speak first, and then Ms. Nuria Fon, a postdoctoral researcher at the Pompeo Fabri University. She works with Maria Rudo Sarate, who has been unable to attend this morning. She is a doctor of geography and works on inequalities and feminist cartographies. And finally, Barbara Biglia, a Sarah Hunter aggregate professor at Rebuda Ibergili University in Tadragona. She works in the pedagogy department. She has been one of the main drivers in the field of feminist methodologies and epistemologies in Spain and is part of the SIMPREF coordination group, a multidisciplinary group devoted to feminist research methodology. And she has many publications uh, over her career and articles in this field. We don't have much time, so without any further ado, let's give the floor to Wendy Harcourt for her to share with us her presentation. Wendy, when you're ready, you can take the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and apologies that I'm speaking English. And um, I'm very pleased to be sharing my thoughts and I hope that I can proceed to hear your thoughts as well. Um, so my reflections are based on conversations I've been having with students and colleagues about how feminism shapes research questions and processes and how to understand feminist positionality in academic processes, and then how to share results beyond academic avenues. Um, some of these conversations can be found in an open access book I edited together with four young feminist scholars entitled Feminist Methodologies, Experiments, Collaborations and Reflections, which we published um, last year in 2022. Um, in the book, we set out what doing feminist methodologies entails. Feminist research navigates dominant structures of knowledge, production, in creative and involving processes, which are often explicitly experimental and are often seen on the margins of academic scholarship. In this way, feminist research challenges the status quo of Western rational knowledges by asking ethical questions about how we are producing knowledge. For example, whose work we are reading and citing, with whose thoughts are we thinking through our research questions? Which stories do we centralize and how do we tell those stories? And how do we reflexively work through our privileges and multiple positionalities in our research? Such questions are not only part and parcel of engaging with feminist methodologies and doing research as feminists, they are critical to understanding what we can and what we cannot produce as knowledge. So in this sense, feminist research pays attention to the relationship between emotional, bodily and thought processes as part of our knowledge production. This requires acknowledging diversity in gendered lived experiences, inequalities and injustices. It also means being aware of the relationships we weave with humans and more than humans during our research. Our passage through certain places leaves traces, sometimes invisible to our senses, but very persistent for others. So how do we gain the sensitivity to navigate these waters with care? Who and what is this research for? These are all questions that are not easy to resolve. 
but they are questions that give opportunities as feminists to be open and engage in productive discussions and listen to each other, and often embracing what Jack Halberstam calls the queer art of failure as part of our feminist method. In the book, we propose some key feminist tools for methods and ways of thinking through research processes. So I just wanted to list a few of these here. First of all, intersectionality as a way to visualize co-constituting identity, structures of power and oppression, as well as intersecting and overlapping political issues. Intersectionality calls attention to the multiple identities of researchers or research participants, and is a methodology to analyze how different cultural and socio-political issues are entwined. The second is embodiment. Doing feminist research is necessarily an embodied practice, given that bodies, embodied experiences and feelings are at the heart of feminism. The embodied lived experience plays out in research interactions, analysis and writings. Embodied experiences, whether written, visual or poetic, show how sensing feeling or what we feel on the skin and in the heart and on our bodies informs how methods shape feminist research. A third is relationality. Research is at the core about relationships, examining, looking at and unpacking connections from different perspectives. Beyond seeking out and exploring connections, relationality also requires an understanding, as Donna Haraway states, that beings do not pre-exist their relations. Thinking in and through relationality as a way of overcoming modern dichotomies and moving towards non-dualities, which is at the heart of the feminist project. Seeking out connection through relationality, feminists challenge the separation of genders, generations, and the academic activist divide. Another tool is paying attention to emotions, which are often dismissed as they're serious or not particularly relevant to academic research. Feminist research approaches have a long tradition of paying attention to emotions, grappling with the role of emotions in research and how to access and understand such forms of knowing. Building on understanding of emotional geographies, emotion in feminist methodo methodologies is understood not so much as an internal process bound to individual subjectivities, but as being relationally produced between people and places. By paying attention to the way feminist researchers infuse emotions into the text, feminist methodologies are also open to possibilities for exploring alternative ways of theorizing and expressing themselves through storytelling, visual illustrations and drawing. Then finally, the listening to silences and the art of noticing. Feminist methodologies are also about looking at what is not said, what is excluded and what is pushed out of the realm of academe. Practicing the art and politics of noticing, noticeably in terms of everyday emotions around care for others, including more than human others, in creative and innovative ways is key to feminist method and at the core of how feminists change academic practice. By taking into account relationality and the ethics of care and doing research that is not extractive or oppressive, feminists do research that is in solidarity and allyship with whom they are doing the research in ways that are inclusive and part of a politics of radical hope and a process of caring with. It is part of the feminist process of producing other than master stories, which acknowledge emotions, vulnerability and pain when dealing with patriarchal hierarchies on different scales, individual collaborative and communal processes of reflection, which is where feminists are at the borders of academe and can be open to pluriversal worlds. So just to conclude, feminist methodologies disrupt fact value, theory, practice and science and activism dichotomies. Feminist methodologies are counter-narratives to dominant traditional models of research and science through foregrounding the experiential and embodied nature of doing research, through sharing stories and making visible the negotiation of multiple identities and positionalities, ethics and the complexities of everyday research. Feminist methodologies show that knowledge is not disconnected from, but rather entwined with emotions and experiences. I hope that's a one one way or to kick off a kind of um, discussion about feminist methodologies and the importance of feminist epistemologies um, based on that book, but um, based on obviously a transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary discussion amongst feminists in the school where I work, which is the International Institute of um, Social Studies, which is looking at critical ways of understanding development. 
Um, thank you very much. It's a bit awkward being here. I'm not sure if that if that was uh, enough of an introduction, but I'll, I'll hand it over to you and I hope I can also find ways to listen to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, for those remarks, which are very suggestive and very interesting to begin the debate that Nuria and Barbara will now continue. And so without any further ado, let me give the floor to Ms. Nuria Fon. Thank you very much. Good morning. And thank you for the invitation, even though I am here as a substitute for Maria Rudeau. The idea is to give you some ideas that we are getting in the project that we are carrying out on relief maps with an improved version or a broader or more complex version. A relief map, if you're not familiar with the term, is a method or model that is designed to take up systemize and analyze inequalities from an intersectional, emotional, and also geographic and spatial perspectives. In this new phase, with this spatial or geographic perspective already introduced, we want to go a bit further. And we want to include other cartographic techniques that have not been as compatible with the feminist methodologies such as maps, and geographic information systems, the more hardcore uh, aspects of this. Relief maps, which were initially created in an analog way with map pencils and paper, now has a digital online format. And now we're working with another version that is going to include that model, but also introduce geographic coordinate data collection on an X, Y axis basis. Research on inequality and intersectionalities have often touched on the public sphere as something isolated and external from other dimensions. And also, there's been a lack of an emotional dimension. I won't insist on the intersectional properties that Ms. Harcourt has already mentioned, but I would focus on the important role of the context, space, places, and also in setting a framework, conditioning, the context for these intersectional relationships. A single space has different meanings and it is linked to different emotions depending on our different positions. So the highest challenge that we face and the reason we are here today is how to go from places which are already incorporated as places, as the public space, as the street, as educational centers, how to go from that concept to a view in which uh, we have spaces that go beyond the information systems, the geographic information systems that we have. It is a Cartesian approach in which entities and places are not interrelated. They are distant from each other. The challenge is how to turn emotions into a language of coordinates in the X and Y basis as we usually do in geographic information systems how to make visible through maps the silenced issues and scales and all these programs, things like the body, the domestic scale, caregiving, caretaking, and how to use all of these technologies so that they do not reproduce or reinforce power relationships, oppression systems, territorial stigmatization processes. In many cases, maps have been used to represent reality in a certain way, and it may become a mechanism of oppression and inequality. Maps are not neutral devices, nor are they objective, nor are they transparent. And that is why we face this challenge of incorporating them into the relief maps because they are powerful tools with which to decry, to report, to heal, and also examine new and different realities. In this task of rethinking geographic information systems and the Gs, the feminist cartography or feminist approaches to visual media gives us certain clues, such as reflexivity, 
the critic so-called subjective critical subjectivity of science also has images and visual media things that have had visual media to consolidate an androcentric view of the world and they use these mechanisms to convince us and also hide their ideology interests and responsibilities legitimizing and perpetuating relations relationships of domination in these Cartesian uh, formats in which nothing is uh, connected, everything is separated from each other. How to apply reflexivity if we use these methodologies in a broader context that covers the process, the process of building data, building databases, algorithms, the processes and decisions that we make when we make maps, when we simplify and map reality, the visual cartographic language that we use also incorporating an intersectional perspective, the cartographic silences, and to also report the effects and impacts that some of these lines, apparently inoffensive lines, on maps have, such as property lines. There would be no property, no private property if we couldn't delimit it. Maps have had a key role in dividing up the world. And also the borders, who can cross this border, that border, who is in, who is out. Feminist research, and as applied to, uh, to maps, maps can be tools that are emancipatory and transformational. And that is why we want to appropriate these technologies from the inside. We not only want to make another kind of map that recovers all these kinds of new map making from the outside, counter cartography, but we want to begin to change, report all of these cartographies that are made through geographic information systems. Along those lines, the concept of counter cartography is very suggestive and useful because it tackles cartography from a perspective of understanding maps in a problematic way and analyzing how they help us or don't help us from an intersectional standpoint to understand silences and the effects that maps have. But in a more active way, they give life to other central dimensions of life, such as emotions, places, scales that up to now have not had a voice, have not had a place in all of these representations. In these relief maps, which we are now developing in a process marked by doubts and questions, but we are working to do this. And we understand that these relief maps must be, or maps in general, must be an approach that comprehends all of these things, not just a matter of what are we going to do with all these data? But the whole process must take up this intersectional critical view toward these technologies and many of the other things that we've heard about. This importance of the emotions, this importance of the body, this importance of having control and a voice in the midst of all these technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nordia. It's been very interesting to hear your presentation as we've been able to bring down to earth many of the matters that Wendy brought up in her remarks and see how they are transferred to a framework of empirical research, as is your project on relief maps. Now, let's give the floor to Barbara Biglia. Hello to one and all. Thank you for being here so early in the morning. My role after these two uh, previous speakers is to explain why all of this is relevant in a feminist economy congress. Wendy did a wonderful job by bringing to our attention many of the proposals of feminist epistemology. And that's one of the great challenges that she works with. I'm perhaps less optimistic than her, as I don't think we have them yet. We are still in the process of constantly trialing and erring and learning and, and not uh, producing in a very robust way things that we would like to have already. We're still on the path to having them. And then Nuria has 
set a very specific framework, a specific tool on how to work with this. And this is what we are lacking, how to go from epistemology to methodology so that it's not all abstract and how this, how we can relate these new ways, alternative ways, or interesting or dissident ways of producing knowledge to the matter of feminist economy. I am not an expert in economics, so I ask myself, what is, what are economics? What is the economy? We could understand, I hope the economists don't get mad at me, but economics has to do with management of resources be they natural resources, human resources, economic resources. If you look at it that way, what might we think as for what could we contribute to a feminist economy that is trying to go beyond production logic, the logic of people just being a number, and that the most important spaces are the monetary spaces. First of all, dialogue, the epistemological part, is probably the same basis, having a feminist method or providing a feminist economy must be based on a lot of the learning that we've taken from feminist epistemologists, in my opinion. This has to do with situated knowledge, everything that has to do with situated knowledge. So how to work on epistemology with situated knowledge. We must understand that the subjects and agents that participate in these economies are many more numerous, are, are much more numerous than uh, what we're usually told. Feminist economy, I think that this, we can take away from this the importance of decision-making processes and processes of imagining what this economy really is, the subjects that have been kept out of the economic production spaces must be given a central role in the decisions that we are now rethinking at the economic level. Furthermore, everything that has to do with finding and defining instruments, tools, for our approach to social realities not be cis-normative and colonial. This is a very nice declaration of intent, but when we try to bring it into practice, one of the things that we are failing at, at least partially, is perhaps it's a matter of self-defense. Perhaps it's respect for the attacks on the scientific production area, this quote-unquote feminist scientific production, which is not evaluated the same way in different uh, panels and so forth. There's a tendency to defend ourselves and to present our narratives as closed narratives. And I believe that one of the fundamental matters before us is exactly what I mentioned at the beginning. Recognize how we can make this effort and admit that it doesn't always work as we would like it to. And we must rethink ourselves and we must make mistakes and we must make our mistakes public. Because it's only by making our mistakes public that we will enable our own advancement by being able to say but if we're not able to say uh, I made a mistake we'll be going back to the logic that we're criticizing just to get recognition we will say that our methodology has been very well applied with a very good feminist methodology and then we're not allowing for any possibility of learning from our own mistakes at the collective level. And this goes against the diffraction of 
Donner, that is the idea that it's not just us who are reflecting on our knowledge processes. We must facilitate this for other subjects with other viewpoints, more than viewpoints, I would say positions, subjects with other positions, be able to reinterpret and re-understand, to say it one way, knowledge, this knowledge from another logic. Along these lines, we've heard a lot about the emotional and caretaking and caregiving, but we must make sure we don't essentialize what is supposedly feminist or feminine. It's normal for the emotional to form part of our research processes, but it should not be considered something intrinsically feminine. It should not be considered something that we must have because we are women. And it's the same criticism that you could make or that Mary Luce Esteban made about care and how sometimes from feminism we have tended to have a somewhat utopic view of what care should be. Like this sacrifice that we like to take care of others. And it's something like a vicious cycle that takes agency away from caregivers and especially in the political decision-making process and is not seen as another part of a sustainability process for life, which can have its nice moments and its difficult moments. That's where our work is. It appears that we're being exploited, but then the act of giving care is something nice, something beautiful. If you talk to a caregiver, or if it happens to you, if you have to care for someone, especially for elderly people, you know, we hear a lot about young, taking care of young kids, if they are healthy, you know, you get a lot of joy out of that. But when you're caring for an elderly person, it's something that generates more anxiety and tension. It's not one of those things where you say, oh, great, now I can quit my day job and not read any more books and take care of an elderly person. It's a matter, you know, I can sacrifice everything I was doing and care for an elderly person. You don't, uh, you don't hear that. It's not something to be idealized. It's part of life. So it's how to approach these contradictions, the importance of recognizing this element that's so important as emotions and care as something central within the context in the production of knowledge as well as the feminist economy. But at the same time, we don't want to idealize and we don't want to, we don't want to think that just by having a clear idea of what we have to not have discrimination and be intersectional and being critical of objectivity, that we're not actually reproducing part of that. So that covers my 10 minutes. And I would now uh, leave it up to you to continue with this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, and thanks to all three speakers for sticking so uh, closely to the time allotted, which does not always happen. And that gives us now the opportunity to begin a discussion here all together with the different suggestions, ideas, and other things that may have emerged as we've listened to these three experts. Who would like to take the floor? Raise your hand. If you raise your hand, you will be brought the microphone. It's hard to take the leap at this early hour. Let's see if anyone... Yes, thank you for those three presentations. I am uh, on the organization committee of Demons and I haven't been able to been 
I've been able to attend many sessions. It's been great to be here. Following the remarks of this analysis from uh, Barbara, how can we identify as we incorporate the feminist perspective in the construction of knowledge, how can we create mechanisms to analyze these contradictions? Do you have any suggestions about how, especially when it comes to incorporating the feminist perspective in knowledge production processes and research and so forth and not have a critical revision, which is, I think, what you are proposing. And I see that this hypothesis is also formulated through learning and visualizing the incorporation of feminist perspective in knowledge production spaces. What mechanisms, what instruments can we create and use to actually bring this to, to practice uh, in our work. Thank you very much. I don't have the answer, unfortunately. I can say how I try to do it. When I wrote my thesis, I used a metaphor and it's very powerful on um, also how we can navigate between two worlds and how we are bastards, female bastards. And with these processes, it's a matter of, first of all, giving them a collective space. And I think that one of the topics that has arisen from social movements and feminism is this dichotomy of being inside or outside. Um, am I inside or outside of the institutions, for example? And when you're inside, you're in the belly of the beast, but it's not actually the belly of the beast. And it's a matter of acknowledging that duality and from that space, being able to produce certain processes, but that means you must associate. You have to commit yourself. For example, when I publish an academic article, if I want it to be recognized, I probably have to include much less of the inner workings of what's behind the article because I only have so much space. But if I don't in include my own particular things, people won't know me and they won't want to read me. So sometimes you have to make compromises that way or seminars that we hold with CINREV in which we discuss and support and are very open about mistakes we've made trying to publish in other formats, publishing videos, taking part in conferences, classes with students, having a multi-channel approach that way. And in time, when I work as a reviewer, I accept many more articles that show the inner workings, the, the recipe behind the dish, so to speak. Um, you can't change the feminist thought production or acknowledge production process by being entirely disruptive. It's a more of a gradual disruption, admitting that sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes we contradict ourselves. I don't know if anyone else would like to make any proposals. Actually, we'd had a conversation earlier that has to do with a panel that we'll hold later on intersectionality and racist outlooks and intersectionality. But one of the questions we wanted to bring up 
here is this whole process of depolitization and whitewashing that is taking place with intersectionality. It's somewhat shocking as we talk about intersectionality to realize that the domination matrix or power hasn't been spoken about. There's been no discussion of power or domination, and that's one of the central pillars of the political epistemological approach, nor has there been anything said about racism. How can it be? Or what do you think is happening with intersectionality in terms of these whitewashing and depolitization that have made matters that are fundamental to this epistemological and political uh, approach, thinking of exfoliation, domination, exploitation, and taking the focus away from the more hegemonical feminist perspective, looking at looking more at these issues that have more to do with this relationship between patriarchy, racism, colonialism, things that are tightly interlinked, and it all ends up becoming analysis of summatory analyses and just referring to intersectionality and not specifically mention any of these matters. This is a very wide-ranging question, I know, but this is one of the spaces in which we can speak openly and speak clearly. I thought that this might be a good opportunity to ask that. Thank you, Nisaya. I think the three speakers want to speak, but maybe Wendy could take the floor, and I think she wants to speak to this issue as well. Okay, thank you very much. Great that you raised that question. I have to admit that in my intervention, I uh, sorry, um, Wendy. I think you have to was leaving that to when I thought I was going to be asked another question. In terms of underlying, can you yes, Wendy, please. Your audio, I, audio. I, another question. I have to close some of that question. Can you? I'm not. Wendy, please. Okay. Your audio, I have to close some It's going in a loop. Okay. Hold on. I'm not. Wendy, please. Okay. Okay. Try Is again. Is that better? Can you hear me though? Yes. No. Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah, I, um, I'm dealing with suddenly a lot of screens. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the question. Um, I hope to be uh, answering or talking more about um, colonialism and racialized subjects in an answer to what, what, what is it that uh, feminist methodologies um, can give to uh, a really radical rethinking of homo economicus, which I actually think is the charge of most feminist economists is to really unpack um, systematically uh, the kinds of underlying power relations that really dominate uh, the economic narrative. Um, and I agree very much with what Barbara said, that it's important to admit our failures in this sense. Um, and being particularly within academe, um, caught up in all sorts of other strategies of um, trying to be seen and visible and professors, et cetera, et cetera. So um, great question, and I'm very glad that it's on the table. Um, of course, it's also on the table of the privileges of, what, of where we are now being able to speak about things. And in terms of my intervention, uh, that book was very much struggling with um, who is being able to speak and even in speaking who we're silencing and the kinds of erasures that um, nice books written um, in comfortable surroundings can lead. Um, so I think it's, it's not an easy question at all, but it's one that we do have to take um, to heart as feminists and the kinds of hierarchies and privileges that we're also practicing. Um, the strategy for me is to tell those other stories, is to uh, notice what is not being seen. That's what I meant by um, looking at um, the, art, the, the, the idea of the art of noticing, but also the silences which are there and are in the ways in which we work, um, including, I guess, on this panel. Um, we, we are obviously um, of a certain privileged uh, positioning ourselves. Um, so 
great to raise that question, but then what to do about it in academia, I think, is to tell very different stories. Stories that are contextualized, stories that have a narrative that challenge immediately this kind of power relation because people are living with it and suffering the pain from it. Um, I totally agree that care is not some sort of nice fuzzy thing, although we all can love um, and we all care, but it's actually a very political project to push care and to push awareness of the stories of care of of, of many people, most many women, but also others, um, at, to the forefront of how we see what's going wrong with the economic system. So it's not a it's not a sort of um, let's celebrate women caring. It's saying this is what actually has enabled our world to continue, and that we need to make those stories just as important as the meta narratives of Homo economicus. So a uh, great question, and I really think that. Um, I also am not an economist. I've worked for years with very uh, brilliant feminist economists, but I still see economics in a very negative way as a dominating discipline, which does not allow all these uh, important feminist insights into its very uh, types of stories that it tells. So I think it's a challenge to everybody. Thank you. Bueno. Uh, in my case, I don't feel like the most appropriate person. If Maria were here, she has worked on this concept a lot. She could probably give you a better answer. I will tell you my answer from a different uh, position. I'm just now learning about intersectionality. I haven't said much about it because I'm just now learning about it. It seems very relevant what you've asked. And it does resonate with things that I've researched in feminist cartography that's very much influenced by this Anglo-American hegemonical outlook of feminist cartography, what that is, and that I'm working on attempting to, well, I think there are very few bridges different between different ways of understanding, I'm talking about something very specific, but it is my area that I feel comfortable in. There's been little dialogue, little cross-contamination from this hegemonical view, critical view of feminism as regards cartographic practices. It's a very suggestive question. I um, thank you for it. It's something we must include and that we must be aware of. I want to be aware of as I develop all of this. And that's all I can say. I can't contribute much more and I apologize. I think that it is also one of the hottest topics of today's debate. It's something that with intersectionality, it's the same as with other social movements that are claiming hegemonical spaces that are absorbed by the system, that are emptied that are used in an acritical way. This happens quite often. And there can be this question of what to do about it. Today, the very concept of feminism is a concept that is being emptied and being used very often by people who, until just a few days ago, were very anti-feminist, but now they want to have some pinkwashing As for non-specific intersectionality, the way I feel is that I am authorized to say I'm going to keep using this. As for intersectionality, the use of the term itself I have contradictions and I don't know what to do, to be honest, because on one hand, I think using the term intersectionality in my research is a way to recognize the work and the proposals of black feminists and racialized feminists. On another note, it may appear or may become a way of reappropriating terminology 
that is not mine. Facing this contradiction, I get by as best I can. Sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I try to cite the authors who have coined the term that is being used in such a way that whether it's the term or the type of analysis that they propose for a longer period and I wait for them to tell me whether or not it's a good idea to use it or not. And so it's a matter of waiting and seeing. One thing is the term, the other is to talk about power relations. That is fundamental. To talk about domination matrices, that's fundamental. And that forms part of many feminist analysis that we try to do. Obviously, from situated knowledge of a non-racialized person who's had certain privileges, so we are going to be lacking some other parts that we can enrich ourselves with through dialogue. I think that about this topic itself, there is another panel. If you'd like to tell us uh, when that's going to be held, it'd be interesting to make a link with that upcoming panel. Well, before I do that, I'd like to touch on a few of the things we've heard here this morning. But uh, yes, it's true that Ursula and a few other colleagues will be holding a panel from 12 to 2. And we hope to see you there and hope to engage in dialogue, which I think will be interesting. It's called In the Name of Intersectionality. And we have been fighting to get more time to talk because it's very important and very interesting for us to be closer to each other because we must revise each other. We must revise all feminist theory and all the different positions that it contains because my impression is that beyond this terminology, which has a genealogy and has a whole situated knowledge behind it of how and why it emerged, when it comes to the academic world, especially a hegemonic academic world and very dominantly Christian, it appears that we are constantly saying mea culpa, we've made mistakes. Uh, it's okay to make mistakes, but let's revise, let's review. What What is going on? What do we want? What society do we want and what society do we live in? In that context, that's the invitation that we'd like to make. This dialogue is necessary. That's why we're here. Okay, thank you very much. We need to wrap up. Yes, one of the things uh, that we're going to discuss is that it's not a matter of who can use or not use that term. It is a deeper thought process. And it's going to be held in the same room from 12 to 2. Perfect, then we'll see you then. And we need to close this panel here as there's another round table discussion coming up. Let me thank Wendy Harcourt for being with us this morning online, following all the proceedings and the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nuria. Thank you, Barbara, and everyone who has made this discussion possible, the translation services, the streaming services, and all the organization services behind this Congress, and to all of you who have attended this session and made this wonderful opportunity possible that of the Feminist Economy Congress, and we will see you at the next discussion. Thank you.